Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. It's a rare honor and a pleasure to have James Cushing, poet scholar, and his daughter, Iris Cushing, poet scholar, with us today. <laughs> I admire and respect them both for their poetry and scholarship and value their friendship deeply. Iris will read first and then Jim. Iris Cushing is a scholar and poet living in the Catskill Mountains. She is the co-editor with Jason Weiss of Mary Norbert Quartz Jumping into the American River. Is that the correct pronunciation for her last name? Uh, Cordy. It's Cordy. Cordy? Mm -hmm. Cordy. Of Mary Norbert Cordy's Jumping into the American River, New and Selected Poems, Argos, Argos Books, TKS, 2023. Her poems and critical writings have appeared in numerous publications, including Granta, Fence, and the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day series. Poetry collection Wyoming won the 2014 Furniture Press Poetry Prize. Recently, the author of the first books of David Henderson and Mary Corte, a research Ugly Duckling Pressy. 2020 and into the long, long time, how Mary Corti saved the Redwoods, Ink Cap Press, 2019. Here's a marvelous poet, Iris Cushing. Thank you, Harry. It's so wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in Harry's Poetry Hour. You are one of my um, just lifelong heroes and um, you know, I'm just really thrilled to be a part of this awesome thing that you're doing. Um, so thank you for inviting me and my beloved, amazing dad, James Cushing. Um, I'll read a few poems first, and I'm going to set a timer for myself just so I know how long I'm going for. And, um, and then after that, I'll read a little bit of prose. Um, Actually, one of the poems that I'm going to read, the one that I'm going to start with, includes a little song. Let me find that now. This song, well, when I read this poem, you'll, I think, probably be able to tell what it's about. It's based on a mondegreen, um, and then this poem is called Love Song for Bob Aran. And it begins with an epigraph from Jack Spicer. I am tired of the efforts of the invisible world to become visible. Hearing your signal, I ran Bob to the radio saying your single syllable, the ba, ba, ba of you, your name in that song, a yolk in an egg, vowel sound wrapped in a sacred tension, a clear shroud made out of the letter B around the ah. Ba, Baran, I had to dance. I went to the dance, cracked my shell against an edge, spilled myself. I thought I'd take a chance, Bob, that I might feel you there that I might know you before I saw you, my shyness under the doo-wop's kid skin surface. Eyes closed, I kept my knees bent loosely, entered some old song, imagined myself with long liquid hair, waist twisting in a pair of cut off shorts, feet in velvet stilettos. And then I held that thought whispering, ba, 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 baran. And when I opened my eyes, you were there a light that changed from blue to green to Bob Aran flickered around you. You bent at the elbows and wrists. Your lapels opened over your chest and closed to the beat, to the ba, 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 Baran. I thought I'd take a chance. I thought I'd take my hand and place it where shoulder meets neck, 
a hot point for both of us to move out of. And then your hand was on me too, Bob. Do, 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 go, girl. Do you, do you, do you, do you wanna? Blue moon, you saw me. Not needing more than the first five letters of the alphabet, that's how full I was with you. You got me rocking and rolling. You had me clanging and a banging. You had me muffling and a scuffling. You had me juking and a spooking. You had me pinking and a thinking. You had me whining and a shining. You had me whooshing and a cushing. Your plush, flush epaulets in midnight light. You had me at the tip of your necktie. Bob ran. Ba, 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 ran. Um, this poem is called Love Song for Barbara Ann. I see Barbara Ann in a ranch house on the edge of Reno, running jumper cables under a hood with hinges that cry like a cat when opened. She leans over the engine, long hair gathered atop her head in folds and rolls like ma kettle. What holds Barbara Ann's long hair in place? She places the copper clamps on the battery knobs, then turns to affix the cable's other ends to the battery of a riding lawnmower. Fingers crossed that this interspecies jumpstart will do the trick. It does. On her drive to town, Barbara Ann considers that she might barber the way she mows lawns, moving over men's heads as benign domes of very fine grass. With her fingers, she feels the earth under strangers' scalps. Barbara Ann works in lively blades in rings of meditation, has hands that always find the right ratio between surface and edge. She arrives in town, parks adjacent to the bank, drops her cigarette in the rain gutter, stops to pick bird shit off her candy stripe pole with her fingernails. She doesn't wash her hands before her first head of the day is in the chair. I see her snapping a plaid smock around his neck and meeting his eyes in the mirror. She holds the white hair at his nape between her index and middle fingers, closes on it like a pair of soft scissors, black traces of engine oil and white crumbs of pigeon poop that only she can feel mixing with the lilac vegetal in the man's warm strands. He's known her for years. He closes his eyes as she hovers around him happy to know her body, her smells of tobacco and grass, so close to his face. Uh, these are uh, a pair of poems that I wrote in response to and something that I've noticed uh, on the radio, which is that politicians have a tendency to say, let me be clear a lot. It's like a verbal tick that they don't seem to have any control over. And they often say it when they're about to either lie or say something totally obtuse and, um, you know, hard to make sense of, but they, they proceed it with saying, let me be clear, almost like a way of kind of excusing themselves for what they're about to say. And I find it to be a really strange and fascinating verbal tick of late. So these two poems, um, this first one is called, let me be clear prelude. Let me be clear as clear as a pair of woven jelly sandals purchased at Payless Shoes, June 1995. No, clearer than that. Let me be as clear as icicles hanging on the edge of a nomad's yurt in Mongolia, the Gobi Desert in winter. Let me be as clear as the winter sky as seen through the prisms of those icicles. Let me be as clear as plastic wrap stretched over a blueberry muffin in a gas station clear as the oil filming the muffin's dimpled surface, clear as the air coming through the pump outside that same gas station. Let my clarity be an exponent of itself. Let my clear be emphasized, enhanced, redoubled. Let my clear be emptied of myself and be only clear sovereign. Don't let me be mistaken. I don't wanna be misunderstood. I'll be clear as the popular girl's skin in junior high school, 1995, Jennifer, Sarah, or Ashley. I wanna be as clear as the water bottle Ashley drank from as I sat sweating at my desk, 
reading O'Hara's Second Avenue, I scintillate like a glass of ice, not clear, not invisible, see through. Let me be clear, refusal. What I'm about to say is not a lie, and I hope that's very clear. The seahorse ruler of this interspatial realm will not compromise when it comes to the worthiness of the folk art products of inter-realm subspecies. The seahorse commander of one of innumerable worlds, location unknown, will not comment on the meaning of grassroots stagecraft, has nothing to say, and will not be agreeing to a portrait. Let me be clear as clear as the glass of the frame of the portrait he will not be sitting for, as clear as the window for light to come into the room, the room where, make no mistake, the seahorse ruler will not be posing. I want to be abundantly clear here. Let clarity abound, a forest of bright fronds to hide in. Um, I wrote this poem, um, Earlier this week, it's about going to have lunch with my sister in Queens, um, in Elmhurst, Queens, at a Thai restaurant called Chow Thai. It's called Chow Thai. Chow Thai, that's the Thai place we went on Sunday where the, for the first time I tried thousand-year-old eggs. They were the color of thunder clouds laden with rain, quartered and sauteed with pork, peppers, and basil. Flavor edging the whole morning. Every swallow of egg held an invisible truth. For 20 years, I didn't eat a single egg. Between bites, I shared this truth with you, surprised you didn't already know. I shared this truth the way someone shares an intimate detail on a first date, something revealing and possibly endearing about themselves. But you and I are siblings. How could you have failed to notice the absence of eggs on my plate during our 5,000 mornings together? The golden curry sauce on the soft shell crab you ordered touches me somewhere I haven't felt in ages. You've perfected the look of gold eyeshadow all around your eyes, touched by reflection from the window to tabletop to covered in glass. I remember you hated hard boiled eggs, you say to me. I'm proud of you for getting over it. Our mother is pickling in her illness on the other coast. I can feel you thinking what I'm thinking, how much she would love this meal, a quantity filling a volume nearly continent sized. We agree out loud that she would be proud of us, each of us for choosing something unknown. This is a California poem. It's called Recreational Vehicle Sanctum. And I wrote it um, one summer when I was living in an RV in Oakland. Um, I was working with the poet Diane De Prima actually when I wrote this poem and um, commuting from Oakland on the BART train into San Francisco. But this was written in an RV in Oakland. Recreational Vehicle Sanctum trails behind a truck that doesn't exist. Stuck here in its backyard niche, poised beside the bougainvillea. A bed of succulents grown from outmoded sneakers. California equals magic until the sun rots your living body. Cactus in full sun tufts shreds at the weave of an umbrella. Outside my trailer home, roll a mat out on the concrete. Inside the fractured shade, I stretch this old bod out. An elder bodhisattva of the forest showed me how. He too lived in a trailer at the end of a long dirt path, kept himself hairless, which is how and where I found him hanging from the ceiling by a purple strap spinning at the center of a warped LP. How the sun and time together warp the contours of a sanctum into gorgeousness. Or where, tickling the edge of wood paneling, light from a defunct Peugeot comes into the body-sized portal of my trailer cave. Perry, the pervy forest yogi, 
Where are you now that I am grown? Um, I wrote this next poem um, while I was thinking about, I have a almost four-year-old son and um, I will oftentimes pretend to <laughs> nibble on his cheeks or feet. Um, and, you know, those of you who have children can probably imagine it's like a thing that parents and kids do, like pretending to eat your child. Um, I don't know why people do it, but um, I wrote this poem in response to that impulse. Cookie cutter shark. The cookie cutter shark's jaws unfold in two halves making a circle. Sneaks up on other creatures, even other sharks. Gouges a round bite from their flesh, departs. Why do I tell you every morning? I'm hungry, I haven't eaten breakfast yet. I then pretend to eat your cheek and then at night, I didn't have dessert and eat your left foot. You disagree at first, then consent to one small bite. Having you with you all the ways this could mean. For a moment, I become one small part of the painting I once stood before in the Prado, Jupiter devouring his son, that desperate look on his face, an imperfect way of having you, several imperfect methods for reflecting love. Why does a mother want to eat her child, take a parasitic bite, swim away? You say, no, you can't eat my foot, cheek, leg, face. Having you say, why? It's a part of me. That's a real creature, by the way, the cookie cutter shark. It really does um, just swim up to other sharks and take bites out of their side and then swim away. Um, all right, so um, I have been working on a story. Um, it's called Old Pills, and it's about a woman who has insomnia and um, struggles with her insomnia, and one day she finds an old expired bottle of sleeping pills from long ago, and she starts taking them, and to her amazement, they like show her like the answers to the mystery of the universe and reveal this whole like elaborate, beautiful resolution to her life. Um, and she has to figure out what to do without them because there's only a, a few of them in this bottle that she finds. Um, she finds the bottle of pills in her new house when she moves to a new house. She finds the pills in the medicine cabinet. So I'm going to read a little bit of that. I've been working on it for a while and I'm really enjoying it. Um, and yeah, so I'll read the opening insomnia scene and then I'll read um, the part where the woman finds the pills. Okay. The sound made by four wheels on a dark road sealed my fate. I had already been awake for 30, maybe 40 minutes when I heard the faint hum of a car coming down County Route 39. The knowledge that in moments its headlights would wash over the sycamore tree by my window assured me I wouldn't go back to sleep. The car's engine, its movement over icy asphalt, made a small and unobtrusive hum that I knew was really a roar, a faraway roar that grew closer. As the car approached, I felt alongside the roar, the presence of another sound, a secondary pulsing, as if the darkness itself produced a cry as the body of the car sliced through it. The present moment was composed of the darkness clinging to and shedding itself from the car to the car about to pass, a darkness momentarily pushed back by the headlights only to resume in a thick stream behind the red glow of the taillights stretching out and back and beyond. I moved a little in my bed. My pillow in its gray-green pillowcase cradled my head, frizzes of hair stuck to my temples. Where was the driver of the car going? 
If they were going to work the dawn shift at the Walmart warehouse in Birchfield, 15 miles away, that meant it was close to morning. I took deep breaths and visualized the driver parking and approaching the warehouse, swiping a card to open a door, clocking in, walking along fluorescently lit corridors to their station. Station to station, I thought of that Bowie song, the slow, grinding, unspooling guitar rhythm in the beginning, the kind of glamorous dirge that could make working at a Walmart warehouse seem exciting, at least to me, a woman with insomnia, desperately trying to fit two unlike pieces of reality together in the dark. What if the car wasn't going to the Walmart warehouse? That idea proffered the possibility that it was still earlier than morning, that it was, in fact, the middle of the night, whatever that meant. When one has insomnia, the night loses its linearity and becomes something without discernible shape. The middle of the night couldn't be associated with any outcome that could be deduced through reason or past experience. To think that the middle of the night meant I would fall back asleep and wake up in the light feeling rested, this was a cruel thought, and its cruelty made me toss again under the covers more forcefully, as if I could accidentally find a comfortable position by throwing my limbs all at once and seeing where they landed. What if the driver of the car wasn't going to the Walmart warehouse? Where were they going? Why was it that my thoughts immediately turned to the nefarious, the tragic? I thought of a sweaty, rangy meth addict with sunken cheeks, then someone heartbroken and weeping, leaving home. Then I thought of a cop, a state trooper patrolling the countryside. Had I ever driven down a remote country road in the middle of the night? My thoughts seemed to crowd and swarm in the dark room and knock against the windows, disembodied birds trying to get out. I remembered a time I had driven from Salt Lake City to Reno through the night, consuming an entire six pack of Mountain Dew and listening to the same few CDs over and over. Crossing Nevada on I-80 in the dark, the closest thing to piloting a space shuttle that an ordinary American can do. Station to Station was one of those CDs, I thought suddenly. Each song on the album, a territory, a place to move forward and backward into. I shifted again in bed, trying to pull, put the songs in the album in sequence. Word on a Wing, TVC15, Stay, Golden Years. And I'm trying hard to fit among your scheme of things. Nothing's going to touch you in these golden years. I opened my eyes and saw light between the branches of the trees. It was indeed morning, and I was wrong. I had never driven down a country road in the middle of the night. I-80 is not a country road. I got up. I think I'll actually stop there. Thank you. Well, what a fabulous reading, Iris. You're fabulous. Your, your poetry has musicality, love. You see so much. You take us right there and, you know, where it is, whether it's an RV or uh, insomnia. And <laughs> it, just, it has like a great wholesomeness, too. And it really is, it's also elegiac and it's uplifting and it's, it's intoxicating. It really is. It just... You know, you're just fabulous. What a treat for all of us. So I'm glad that you're on the show. And I have a couple of questions for you. When did you write your first poem? Well, I don't know exactly when I wrote my first poem, but I did publish a poem um, in 1987 when I was four years old. I published a poem in a magazine called Pearl, which I believe is a Los Angeles-based magazine that was edited by uh, Joan Job Smith. And um, it goes, the poem goes like this. It's called Sad Keeper. Uh, it goes, today I am going to be a sad keeper, you know, like a zookeeper, except I will keep sad things like dead animals, sad songs, and tears. And that's actually really amazing to think of that because my son, Benny, who's almost four, <laughs> is also really poetic and... I think he's a third generation Cushing poet, and he's also really obsessed with sad things. 
but not in a bad way. Just, I think he's just kind of curious about them. Anyway, that's when I wrote my first poem. You know, in your poem about, or your piece about insomniac, you use the phrase word on a wing and you mm -hmm. sing, you are a singer in your poetry. What uh, attracts you to the poetry form? Um, you know, I think, um, well, I grew up with lots of poetry in my life because my dad is James Cushing, the poet. And um, it always struck me as like the most true and simultaneously the most beautiful and like, I don't know, the, the way of expressing oneself that had the most possibility that and that was a possibility that would keep yielding more and more newness and more truth and more beauty um, in a way that nothing else could. And I don't think I thought of it that way when I was young, but, you know, over, over the years, I've come to think of it that way. You know, that phrase you just used, that could describe your poetry, true and the most beautiful. And uh, who are, I noticed one of your epigram or your epigram, and the one poem was by Jack Spicer, who are a couple of your influences? You know, I, I, I write in a scholarly capacity about mid-century American um, feminist poetry and poetry that kind of exists at the intersection of um, mystic tradition and political activism. Um, and so in the last, you know, decade, I've read a lot of Diane De Prima and Mary Norbert Cordy, um, Charles Olson, um, Jack Spicer, Allen Ginsberg. Um, and I would say those, those poets are, are big influences on me for sure. I feel like they're kind of my poetic heroes and the, um, of just a really fertile, great instance of a time when poets shape the culture um, and actually could, you know, push kind of the cultural zeitgeist in one direction or the other, um, even if it was a kind of underground, not mainstream zeitgeist. So I think those are, those are some of my influences. I don't know how much it really comes up in my own work, but it's something that I, that I think about a lot and that I feel really honored to be involved with. When you sit down to write a poem, what is it that you focus on? Is it words, image, an idea, emotion? What a great question. You know, I'm taking a, I'm taking a, a poetry workshop right now. Um, and I haven't, I haven't like taken a class in a really long time, um, a poetry class. And the, it's the workshop that I'm taking is with a poet named Sophia Dahlin, who lives in San Francisco. And um, being in that writing context has been making me just focus more on like the emotions and the impulse and kind of the phenomena that prompts a poem um, and kind of just letting myself like really embrace that and not worry too much about the language, like trusting that the language will follow from those impulses. Um, and that's felt really, that's felt really liberating recently. I think I've, I've been kind of hung up on, making sure that everything sounds just right. And it's really nice to let go of that hang up. You know, one thing I love about your poetry, you take us right there, you know, in the here and now, whatever it is you're creating in the poem. And you just have such great clarity, as I mentioned early, and such a great fluency. So uh, you're just a, an astonishing young poet. That then I, uh, my wife, Holly, used to say, you know, I knew Beth when she was in the womb. <laughs> Iris, I, I, I called you Beth. It's <laughs> okay. Mom. That's my mom. Yeah. Her mom. Uh, she used to say, I knew Iris when she was in Beth's womb. So you've been with us a long time and you're just, no. such a, there's such a brightness to us. So I want to thank you once again for being on our show. You're, you're incredible. So thank you, Iris. Thank you, Harry. It's an honor to be here and to be here with you and my dad is just fabulous. Thank you. James Cushing, currently directing the Beyond Broke Wednesday Night Poetry Workshop, retired in 2020 after 35 years teaching, teaching literature and creative writing in San Luis Obispo, California, where he served as the community's poet laureate 
in 2008 to 2010, Cushing's poems have appeared widely and his collections include The Length of an Afternoon, Undercurrent Blues, Pinocchio's Revolution, The Magician's Union, Solace, and Tangled Hologram, all from Cahuenga Press in Los Angeles. He lives in Hollywood with poet painter Celeste Goyer, with whom he frequently collaborates. Here's a magnificent poet, James Cushing. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, MPTF. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, to say that this is a momentous occasion for me is to downplay it. Um, uh, I would like to say that it is an honor to be able to appear on the same bill uh, with my daughter, Iris Cushing. I could talk about her for the rest of my time, but all I will say is she is a true poet. And, 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 and we just heard um, incontrovertible evidence of that fact. So I'm going to, uh, um, I'm going to attempt to follow uh, Iris's performance uh, with some poems of my own. And, uh, and I, because this is a special occasion, I wanted to begin with some, uh, some poems uh, to, to give the, some poems their, their public debut, so to speak. Um, uh, here are some pieces that I've never read to an audience that, uh, that I hope give you a clear sense of what it feels like to be this poet at this time in this place. This first poem is called A Place We Are Familiar With. Night after night, I thumb through old books and listen to the pages. Their rustling translates to words that just precede the act of speech, ones I've never heard or said. And the tiny detail the one I had ignored magnifies, taking over the whole frame, and yet I still cannot name it. Part of a machine, an amber earring fragment, a paint-stained hinge, options swirl and I feel idiotic. The pile of books sits just as high as it did before I sat down to read them, but I need something from another room. When I leave my closet, I find the whole house newly cluttered, dirty dishes, pizza boxes, rumpled clothes, beer cans, paraphernalia, heavy metal album covers. Young men have been partying here all week and I heard nothing. I've become a human stone. This is why I'm writing you, my old friend. You understand. Like me, you have carried your father's clothing to the dump. You have seen your scraps of money disappear and your love of John Coltrane has come to resemble a toy hammer in the hands of a sleepy child. It's noon. Right now, seated at the window, I watch black stems and orange flowers make slow turns. And the 14 or so years we have left glow faintly behind them. Even a memory. During your time at the speech academy, you learned to peel your words before starting to braise and butter them. But you never made one friend there. You could say nothing to any of them, nor they to you. And the days became nights with terrible, unnatural speed. We met two years after you left that school. And at first, I couldn't place your accent. I heard you talk about the genius of ants. And you claimed fitting one's life to the land was the key, not what the dead were saying a thousand years ago. The land itself would anticipate the carnival, alert us to the next full moon. Later that night, my pants and boots got soaked and the scroll of my memory stops right there 
as I try on fastening my clothing because my suddenly cold hands are starting to hurt as though angry animals made of ice were living inside my fingers. And bells start ringing all across this whimsical, balled up city. The streets ache from the sound of the many thick arms pulling the bells, many men huffing and puffing, becoming older. The ringing turns the pages in my book. My fingers are still cold. 40 years pass like a slight adjustment. I feel neither comforted nor informed. Strategic silence. I have never been a gambler. I have no grasp of dice, no reading of the wheel. I know no lore of the track or the deck. But my luck has taken the form of a white and green curtain blowing in a rhythm so regular and graceful, you would swear the thing was breathing. Here near the window is a package holding 100 sticks of incense. The golden dust at the bottom is another part of my luck as it sticks to my fingers and clothes. Can the married couple next door smell this incense? If their twin boys knew about this curtain, would they declare it a flying carpet and ride it, becoming as they did Characters in the tale of my luck, two boys on parallel paths toward the marketplace, which, once they enter it, will address each twin by his rightful name. Oh, lucky day. They have as much chance of that as I do of finding a warm, nice house next door to my old place with all my clothes and books and toys just where they always were. And then curling up in my lucky old bed, starting up the humming white machines of sleep, not yet the hero of my story. Old enough to keep. I have seen defensive workhorses poke heads out from my bottle of lubricant, breathing onto my eyes and chest. I have felt the slamming of planetarium's bolt holes, trembling warehouses full of figs and ears of corn. I have heard sideshows filled with the saddest, most disgusting shadows that ever came out of loudspeakers and discerned the blackberries in their ditch, hexagons dazed and shrinking as though amazed. The point is, I could choose. I have chosen my finger, which is a dictionary no one notices, and an x-ray picture of a little gold present made to look like something I say in my sleep. This next poem is called Preoccupations, uh, which is the um, which is the noun that the pronoun them in the first line refers to. Preoccupations. We can't know them, but we can invent a story. In fact, we better start one right now. Shells that held the real story like broken on the kitchen floor, which means we need the whisk broom and cannot put, put the story in present or future tense. Well, at least we know that. And we know the day is in its fullness, the sunlight loud among quiet branches, the morning another thing of the past. In my soft blue clothing, I can see faces from years ago develop in reverse, images fading in the backwards dark room, leaving only plain white pieces of treated paper 
to get stacked up in neat piles after the session ends. In shifting these piles onto another table, I knocked over the shells that held the real story. They shattered, yet no one in the house heard the sound they made. I tell you that sound remains in the room and it cools down the longer it stays. I decipher three words from the shells, gloomy, bitter, overgrown. They hit me right away as parts from a cast spell, which must be part of a story of longing told in a hushed, brown-toned monologue in which nothing is ours. Everything belongs to the people who were here before we arrived. And there's some possible new trouble with my house keys, my wallet, even my shoes. I need a higher vantage point to find them. Sparrow, Robin, Hawk, high rise hotel roof. But now despite my great height, I see them at the bottom of a canyon. They're good, they're safe. And I can stop watching. Again, thank you all so much for listening, and thank you for for, for, for tuning in. If it's a if you're a, a longtime fan of Harry's Poetry Hour, or if this is your first time, uh, again, it's a tremendous honor to be sharing the bill with uh, with my daughter Iris, a true poet. Um, this next poem is in three parts. It's called "The Man Who Takes Out the Ashes." One. In the diorama of dreams where I once lived, one part looks made of rust and ashes, another shows a hundred polished cellos. Then a northbound train pulls loudly into the station. I must get on it, travel two nights through towns and prairies, pick a town, live and work in it, for a number of years before I'm allowed to see any other part of the diorama. By then I know there are a thousand other parts, 5,000, 10. And if I simply lie down in my bed a moment and close my eyes, some process starts, one that must take place unobserved. And those lumpy years combust and burn until nothing remains but ashes. Two, the man who takes out the ashes. Do you see him? His wife and daughter selling apples and tomatoes at the open air market, do you see them? The family appears unchanged, given how much has happened since we saw them last. Have they stayed the same age while we got older, more settled into our pains? Their fields and orchards are filled with ghosts, some with shaggy hair, crossing back and forth day and night. When the sprinklers start up in the noon sun, a purple-blue rainbow pleads with the orchards to rethink their idea of what an apple tree does. I turn to the man pushing his wheelbarrow full of ashes, and in an instant, I get it. He has thought of everything, like a bird, like a doctor, like water. Three. He has thought of the wood grain on my writing desk, the speckled formica of the kitchen, where I watched my mother and father. He has thought of the longing that builds up inside the, inside the earth's chest. And the forest is the round and deep command of that longing. He has thought of me, and therefore I may leave you with these words. He has thought of you, and as you are sad of heart, as you are strong of mine. He has thought of the loud northbound train, has ridden it, 
tells me I may write down this thought and the story of his ride. His ride gave us everything he promised it would. And now we have come to suffer its conclusion, which we never observed as it happened. Two more poems from this uh, sheaf of, um, of recent ones written in um, January and February of this year. Uh, this is called The Carrier. One night, half asleep, I felt my right foot. Had I ever felt this foot before? My old bed, having ferried me safely, lay empty of all but myself and my faded memory, a woman speaking to her teenage son, apologizing to him for something in his childhood, then handing him a letter with his name on the envelope, a letter that became a breeze. I felt the breeze and understood what it meant. I remembered the battered tightening minutes that measured you, the secret wine of it, the constant overstimulation of love and passionate letters I wrote in code, explaining the secret handshake, the one requiring both hands. Before the end of friendship, we see how the mirror is also a game. Its rules, invisible, always secret, it's weather that tells a story no one wants to hear. And the whole argument happened nearly 50 years ago anyway. So when we prod our memory, we see once again how it ended, although the two principles never will. We feel for both parties what we can't name simply. Pity, fondness, anger, admiration, a little impatience. When we came of age, we found our names had not been written in the mirror's book, there among the remembered, the studied, the envied. This year, the same argument falls through space like a dropped mirror, but does not break. For one of us is always there to catch it, no matter how many times the scene repeats. And then, one of us always hangs the mirror back up on the west wall on its little steel hook. Thank you. Um, I think I have time to read some things from my most recent, um, uh, my most recent uh, collection, Tangled Hologram, from, uh, uh, which is from Coenga Press. Coenga Press is the um, I believe the longest lived independent poetry publishing concern in Los Angeles. We've been going since 1989. We have over 20 books, including works by, by, um, by Harry Northup, Polly Prado, Phoebe McAdams, Jonathan Codd, and Anne Stanford. And, um, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the, one of the, uh, great organizations in the city of the angels in my, in my, <laughs> entirely unprejudiced objective view. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I, I, um, um, I think I, yeah, there's time for this. This is, um, uh, this is a prose poem, uh, that I have, uh, I've, I've, I've read, um, uh, a number of times recently and it's gotten, it's gotten a good, uh, uh, a good response. This is entitled Dream of Women. In my dream, Memphis Minnie stands near me, her face sore from laughing. Joan Didion, pale in a light green sundress, stands near her, looking anxious, but Minnie stifles a, gag a giggle anyway. Now Betty Davis and Joan Crawford, wearing their whatever happened to baby Jane makeup and costumes, enter through the kitchen door, arguing, as they like to do, and a minute later, Marianne Moore peers in through the same door, her mother standing a few inches behind her. 
The poet shakes her head and walks away, headed toward, we imagine, the apartment she shares with the elderly lady. Patricia Highsmith comes out from the bathroom where she's been sewing up a rip in the crotch of her pantsuit while having a heart to heart with Elizabeth Bishop about the ups and downs of living in exile, France, Brazil. Who's that napping on the bed? Louise Brooks, as I live and breathe. She's tired from a long week and had to rest a moment. She came with Betty Page, who's reading a magazine over in the corner, guarding Louise's sleep, as she likes to say. The phone rings. Billie Holiday, lost, is asking me for the address. I give it to her. Harla Blay asks me, is that Billy? I need to ask her something. And, I, and she takes the phone. I notice Virginia Woolf in a corner, listening intently to Rachel Maddow, while Dorothy Parker, seated nearby, looks down at her shoes and smokes. A bell rings several times, and the house lights flash. One of our favorites, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, has just arrived with a limo full of friends. Hillary Clinton, Joan Baez, Angela Davis, Janet Malcolm, Yoko Ono, Grace Kelly, Eddie Lamar, Mary Shelley, Gertrude Stein, Myra Hess, Frida Kahlo, Nina Simone, Maxine Waters, Martha Argerich, Sh Sally Ride, Margaret Sanger, Meredith Monk, Carol King, Agnes Martin, Chrissy Hine, Joni Mitchell, Ida Lupino, Simone de Beauvoir, Lauren Bacall, Beyonce, Shirley Chisholm, Exine Cervenka, Wanda Coleman, Jane Freilicher, and Nico. The party's really rocking now. Good thing I live in a big enough place for all these people to mingle, eat, and drink, and sway to some good jazz. This, this dream is turning into a customized version of Desolation Row, what with all these characters. Now, look out the window. Just outside, in the cool air, talking, stand Emma Bovary, Anna Karenina, Odette and Albertine, Daisy Faye, Sabina and Teresa, stuttering Mary Lavov, elegant Mrs. Dalloway, clever Rosalind, scheming Lady Macbeth, sexy Circe, long-suffering Penelope. Sappho takes her Martin acoustic guitar out of its case and starts tuning up. Is it right or wrong to want to live inside this dream as long as I can? Thank you, Jim, for such an astonishing reading. To answer, Thank you, Harry. To answer your last question, it's right. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> but you have such a gracefulness and an inventiveness. You take us to use your words, or you write uh, what's not been written, to use your words. And there's, you too are a true poet. You're an original, and you always, you have such a tragic understanding of what what life is, and you uh, your poetry always transports us to another place through your through your mind and through what you see and through your memory. I mean, I, every time I hear you, you just uh, you know you knock me out. I remember Thank you, Harry. I met Thank you around you, 1979 or 80, and mm -hmm. uh, you're one of the brightest people I've ever met in the poetry world. So this is a blessing to hear you read your poetry along with your daughter. We have about five minutes left. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you like to say to a young uh, student who's beginning to write her first poem? What would you tell her to focus on? Mm. Um, I would tell her to trust her instincts and trust what her intuitions are telling her and to maintain the energetic verbal momentum that goes along with those instincts. Um, I would also, um, I would also point out that, uh, that if you keep writing and then, uh, you look back at what you wrote a year or a year and a half ago and say, Ugh, that was terrible. Uh, uh, I think my stuff is way better now, then that is a sign of growth. And that is a healthy, healthy, good thing. 
So, so, uh, so never be afraid of making any, you know, of, 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 of writing anything that someone would say is, uh, no, no, well, the, the, um, um, one of my favorite examples of this, and, and I, and I mentioned this the last time I was in the classroom, um, uh, um, someone once asked George Harrison, uh, uh, you know, from the, my, my, you know, in the, in the, <laughs> I have him up behind me here. Someone once asked George Harrison uh, why so few of his songs appeared on the first few Beatles albums. I think it was a total of two songs on the first seven albums. Uh, and, and he smiled and said, well, I, I was still developing as a songwriter at that time, and I needed to, and then he paused and said, you see, by that time, John and Paul had already written all of their terrible songs, and now they were writing good ones. And I hadn't written any of my terrible songs yet, so I had to write a bunch of terrible ones so I could get to the good ones. And, 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 and when, I, when I first heard that, I thought, okay, from a, from a, from a, from a, from a, from a street level, working class, Liverpool, England perspective, that is part of the essence of the creative process right there. You have to do a whole lot of other stuff before you find, you know, because there's your intuition here, and then there's language out here, and then there's the world out there, and, and, and those three things have to come into balance. So you just trash out the mind and get it all out there, and then keep, just keep going, I'm keep at it. Believe in yourself, believe that what you are doing has value. Um, uh, Iris, I always believed that what you were doing had value. One thing I love about your poetry is you, uh, sometimes you set an image aloft and it just keeps transforming. And your poetry is always, whether it's interior or exterior, there's always a transformation, which I love about your poetry. And you're always working in the new, too. Thank you. And, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. You're amazing. What do you, how do you, you've mentioned the Beatles on the last, or, you know, on other times that we've talked. About. Right. And how, how uh, influential are the, you know, the songwriters and singers to you and your mm -hmm. poetry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think they're influential um, in, 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 in several different dimensions um, as an only child who uh, who had major, um, you might say, major family functionality problems growing up? Um, I uh, I tended to invest in uh, in the musical figures of the 1960s the same kind of attention and and value that that other people tend to invest in their siblings and their friends. So, so, so I would say that, um, that, uh, that, 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 uh, you know, Dylan, the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix, the Rolling Stones, in a very real way, this is what I had emotionally instead of a family. And I, and I know I'm not the only one who, who does this. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, lyrics and poetry, um, I think, uh, I think Dylan confirmed that uh, that language uh, could could open up whole new worlds and could enact the kind of transformations that I that I felt happening inside me and that I saw happening around me. Are you so so uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, so so yeah. Uh, um, uh, uh, I, I'm thinking especially of the. Um, of um, the sequence, Mr. Tambourine Man, Gates of Eden, It's All Right, Ma, I'm Only, uh, I'm only Bleeding um, on, the, on the Bringing It All Back Home album. By the, by the time I first heard that on the, in the, in the summer I was 12 years old, uh, I felt that a, that a door had, 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 had opened for me. It opened and you stepped through it and you, 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 mm -hmm. you and Iris' reading today has just been a rare, remarkable, uh, exulting reading. I'm I'm just so happy and I'm just so filled with all of your great writing from both of you. And it really is a rare pleasure, as I said. So thank you both. And before we go, I just want to 
let the people who watch what's coming up next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, we pay tribute to the late beloved Tony Sawyer with Jennifer Clymer, Corinne Conley, Helen Richmond, and Kay Wiseman, and a compilation of Tony's extraordinary readings from past programs. So thank you very much, and thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. This was an extraordinary hour, and I really appreciate you guys being here. It's always a treat when James comes on, but certainly to see um, that the you know apple hasn't fallen far from the tree <laughs> was really delightful. Next time we'll have to have my four-year-old on. He's got some poems to share. Oh, uh, you bet he does. <laughs> bet he does. Three generations, more than happy. Keeping it in the family. <laughs>